Thank you for joining us, panelists. My name is Andrew Haberman. I'm Cameron Krauss. I'm Kelsey Nice. And I'm Eric Allen, today presenting on Buffalo Wild Wings. So back in 1981, Jim Dispro and Scott Lowry were two buddies who moved from Buffalo, New York to Columbus, Ohio. And in Ohio, they realized that they were hungry for some Buffalo-style chicken wings, but they couldn't find any. So like any good entrepreneur, they saw an opportunity and took advantage of it. With their signature sauces and their chicken wings, they started their own restaurant, Buffalo Wild Wings and Rec, and they opened it next to Ohio State University. And while it is still popular amongst college students today, it has also grown a fan-like following uh, amongst families and sports fans alike. So Coney Mindset originally focused on college campuses in the Midwest, so Columbus, Ohio, starting off with Ohio State University. As these students graduated and became alumni, they came back seeking that nostalgic college environment and came back with their friends and family. So with this uh, background information in mind and kind of understanding the inception story of Buffalo Wild Wings starting in 1981, I'm just going to transition to some background information and a timeline of Buffalo Wild Wings history. So the first thing I want to point out is that in 1982, they opened their first restaurant under the name Buffalo Wild Wings and WEC, as Cameron just mentioned. And then in 1992, Buffalo Wild Wings opened their first franchise restaurant. Currently, franchises make up half of their physical restaurant locations. And then a few years later, in 1996, Sally Smith was promoted to be the CEO, and she's the current CEO today as well, so this was a monumental year um, in their history. And then in 2003, Buffalo Wild Wings had their IPO. So in 2006, they ran their first national ad campaign on um, channels including ESPN and Westwood One and CBS Sports. And then in 2010, Buffalo Wild Wings announced their plans to start international expansion into Canada. Uh, this is something that will be is beyond the scope of our study, so we'll touch on global a little bit, but not too much. And then in uh, 2012, Buffalo Wild Wings entered into a comprehensive contract with McLean Company, who oversees their um, distribution and supply chain management needs. So they are 100% responsible for 100% um, of Buffalo Wild Wings restaurants. And then in 2015, Mercado Capital Investment Group, who owns a 5% minority stake within Buffalo Wild Wings, started sharing some dissenting opinions from current corporate leadership strategy. So we'll go a little bit more in depth on this later and how it affects Buffalo Wild Wings. Um, and Buffalo Wild Wings has a distinct history in collegiate sports um, and specifically with strategic alliances. Um, you'll hear more about that in the future. Um, but in 2016, the most recent date that we're going to point out, they renewed their sponsorship with the NCAA, which kind of allows them to continue to press into that collegiate market. And now reviewing Buffalo Wild Wings mission statement, there's a few things that stand out to it. That is the people and then the character traits they look for those people to have. They really care about their intellectual capital but more importantly, they look for these traits such as leadership and honesty within their people, so that will be projected out both to other employees, but also to people visiting the restaurant. Buffalo Wild Wings has an opportunity to uh, differentiate themselves in the highly competitive restaurant industry that they are currently placed in. Um, we believe that they can do this by strengthening their brand image, uh, leveraging strategic alliances, and increasing customer perceived value by continuing to capitalize on unique product offerings that they offer that we'll go over um, later in the presentation and continuing to capitalize on that unparalleled sports restaurant experience that they give to consumers. So some of the significance to leadership for our presentation, we've come up with a couple recommendations for long-term financial st sustainability, rather, uh, that if Buffalo Wild Wings corporate leadership implements, we think it'll lead them to a better place as a company. We want to define uh, our definition of sustainable competitive advantage. This will kind of guide the rest of the presentation. Uh, this is something that we know your definition might differ from ours, but it's something that we have defined from the very beginning of the <coughs> semester. Um, and it has guided our study, and it's something that we are unwavering on. So we've defined sustainable competitive advantage as an asset or quality that is difficult to duplicate, it's not easily changed over time, and it creates more buyer value over competitors. Um, and this is typically modeled in niche markets with lower sales volume and higher profit margins. So some of the expected outcomes for this are a move toward a more contemporary structure for Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, Buffalo Wild Wings also would want to focus more on employees and uh, retention, especially leveraging their intellectual capital and advancing them through the company. Some other other expected outcomes include advancing customer perceived value and strengthening their brand image for their fan-like following, also enhancing profit margins as well. And continuing into our research methodology, our research was limited to secondary research. We understand there are some drawbacks to that such as the lack of applicability and questionable reliability of it to our study. But primary research was just beyond the scope of our study. We just did not have the time to do it, nor the financial resources. 
But in order to combat those risks of secondary research, we had environmental scanning, which is the process we took when we found a source. We made sure it was reliable and worked for our study the best it could be. And then we also did ongoing environmental monitoring to make sure those sources stayed reliable throughout the course of our study. Some of those sources consisted of annual reports or other filings, and then also scholarly articles and uh, journals. With this background information in mind, we're going to transition into a situational analysis where, we'll, where we will be looking at internal and external factors. So our internal analysis of Buffalo Wild Wings focuses on the elements that Buffalo Wild Wings has direct control over. These are things directly within the company, and we'll go into those a little bit more in depth for you here. The first thing we're going to look at with this internal analysis is uh, Buffalo Wild Wings leadership. So we're going to start by talking about Sally Smith, who was mentioned previously. She's their current CEO and was unlikely uh, had an unlikely promotion to this position. She was actually the CFO previously um, and has a history in finance and accounting working at KPMG. Um, she got involved with the company in 1994 and then in 1996 the company had actually appointed someone else to be the CEO and he didn't show up for his first day of work and so Sally Smith had an unlikely promotion to this position. Um, additionally, a fun fact about her is that she differs from her customers in the sense that she is a self-proclaimed reading enthusiast over being a sports fanatic. She's been in the same book club for the last 26 years. Um, and then we're going to take a look at this quote on the screen, which basically just summarizes her attitude towards her work. Um, she enjoys what she does and has a desire to retire from this job. There are also some more interesting factors to notice about the leadership. As you can see, they have a senior VP of talent management, which shows their focus on employees and how much they see an opportunity to advance them. Um, it's also important to notice that Judith A. Shulock actually retired in mid-April of this year, and so that just uh, signifies a shift in leadership. Now transitioning into our corporate culture section, this is just a quote. Uh, we'll talk about a little more about this in our HR section of our presentation, but we just wanted to show it to you now. It just sort of shows how the, the training aspect and how much Buffalo Wild Wings really cares about their employees. <clears throat> Uh, additionally, in corporate culture, they place a huge emphasis on training, um, so that will be covered again in the human resources section, um, but it really does contribute to employees and their knowledge of their positions and just kind of those continued advancement opportunities. Additionally, this is a quote taken from their website that uh, communicates that sports verbiage that they use in uh, not only their marketing and their actual product that they're producing in the restaurant experience, but it is something that has infiltrated the corporate culture as well. So the award-winning mentality that we have within Buffalo Wild Wings corporate culture is befitting of their sports niche. So in 2016, Sally Smith won the TDN 2K Workplace Legacy Award for her work as CEO of Buffalo Wild Wings. And then in 2009, she was named IFMA's Silver Plate Award winner for her work within the restaurant industry. Moving into our organizational structure, Buffalo Wild, Wing, Buffalo Wild Wings excuse me, is a very traditionally minded organizational structure opposed to some of the more modern contemporary ones we're seeing arise. We have both, or excuse me, we have Sally Smith, the CEO at the top, and then we have your restaurant frontline employees at the bottom. So now we'll move into human resource management. This is, uh, we'll, start, we'll start with recruiting. So recruiting is fairly normal. They have restaurant and corporate positions, and all these uh, positions are available on the website, all the open positions. Buffalo Wild Wings doesn't really differentiate themselves anyway when it comes to hiring compared to their competitors. It's very traditional, you have your application online, then you uh, are interviewed by a recruiter, and then you are notified on whether you receive the position or not, or the next steps. One thing that did stand out to us was that in a recent interview Sally Smith had with the New York Times, she said that she looks for people who are passionate about what they're doing, are they competent in the position they're applying for, are they curious about the company and where it's going, and are they willing to go above and beyond uh, the work, even if it's not in their job description. So this quote actually uh, is from Sally Smith to the CEO, and it's saying, wait for great. So when they hire employees, they see it, the vacant spot as an opportunity to advance the company and really make the employees feel valued and um, push them forward to leverage their intellectual capital. So there's three different types or subsets of training that Buffalo Wild Wings has. Uh, they have their restaurant manager positions, general managers, and then their hourly employees. So the restaurant managers take part, part rather in a six-week training program that works with the operations and mindset of the company. And then general managers participate in a skills-based workshop on site at the restaurant. And then the hourly employees have different certifications that they work up towards with their specific roles, most notably the wing certified training position. 
And the final function of human resource management is retaining. So Buffalo Wild Wings provides increasing uh, responsibilities for employees to move into those advancement opportunities. Um, specifically with frontline employees, they provide incentives based on sales. And they, have, they also have this distinct perspective for external hiring and internal promotion. So this idea um, that they seek to integrate people who have never worked for the company as they bring new perspectives and new ideas, but they also want to promote those and advance those who have been trained by the company and know it well. Looking at Buffalo Wild Wings marketing, we'll go in depth with the four P's that are marketing mix and looking at how they create, evaluate, distribute, and publicize their offer to the customer. So first and foremost, they have some value-based product offerings. Uh, they have chicken wings, which is their main product, but also what we want to focus on is the sauces. That's really where they originated and came from. Um, the sauces are very important to their business because people come in and choose different sauces, and they also have a sauce lab online where you can go and create a sauce or recommend a sauce. And with regards to price, um, we're going to look at Buffalo Wild Wings as well as two of their direct competitors, Dave & Buster's and Wingstop. We're going to go over why we chose these as competitors when we enter into the financial statements. Um, but for the purpose of looking at pricing models, um, all three of these companies exhibit cost plus pricing, which is when they set their prices based on the cost to the company. Um, you'll see in a minute that Buffalo Wild Wings does differentiate a little bit in that they um, have a little bit higher prices based on customer perceived value. However, um, cost plus price pricing can be risky as it is impacted by a lot of external factors, including minimum wage increases, as well as volatility in chicken prices. This graphic here helps illustrate the difference in prices uh, Buffalo, Buffalo Wild Wings charges versus, versus their primary competitor, Wingstop. Buffalo Wild Wings being a leader in the industry, but also having some value-based value services, such as the unique atmosphere that you experience when you go into Buffalo Wild Wings and the fan-like following one has and the unique sauces, they're able to charge a little bit more even though they're still on a cost-based cost, uh, cost -based prices. So in contrast with this cost plus pricing model that I just touched on, we we'll look at value-based pricing, which is when you can charge premium prices with higher profit margins based on customer perceived value. Um, so if you look at uh, the three different products that uh, Buffalo Wild Wings and its two competitors offer, um, you'll see that Wingstop and Dave and & Buster's have similar pricing while Buffalo Wild Wings is able to charge a little bit more. This is because they provide a really unique restaurant experience that we will go into in a bit, um, but this allows them to charge more and kind of lean towards that value-based pricing while still being primarily cost plus. <coughs> So obviously ordering methods and restaurant placement have a big effect on how the customers perceive the restaurant. Um, they have tablet ordering, which is where a waiter will come up with a tablet, take an order down, and that really furthers the digital business strategies as far as collecting information on different customers. They also have good customer seating, which creates a stadium-like atmosphere that everyone is so much um, after as far as these restaurants go. Uh, this quote also shows that um, they're trying to implement tablet ordering in, or they were implementing tablet ordering in 2015 because they saw it as an important way to advance uh, their business and really learn about the customer. So Buffalo Wild Wings promotion efforts focus on sort of an irreverent and playful vibe um, that's sort of befitting of their playful, carefree, good times vibe that they have in their restaurants. Their primary mediums of advertising are television, radio, and digital in order of importance. And all of their advertisements, television at least, have their black and yellow colors as well as a collection of their in-screen or in restaurant TVs rather, and their Buffalo Circle CRM database email campaign solution is what they use for data capture as well as for giving out promotional offers to their fans. And further in this discussion on promotions and specifically looking at sales promotions, we're going to touch on three <coughs> primary ones. Uh, one promotion that they have is fast break lunch. So it's essentially a guarantee to the customer that if they order off of the fast break lunch menu, they'll get their food within 15 minutes or their money back. Um, additionally, they have uh, day of the week specials, such as boneless Thursdays. And they also use uh, social media to really promote those sales promotions um, through coupons and various promotional efforts, such as the one that you see on the screen. So first and foremost in finance, we want to look at the direct competitors. Uh, the two direct competitors that we've identified are Dave & Buster's and Wingstop. Dave & Buster's having the atmosphere that Buffalo Wild Wings is so well known for. They have that kind of vibe to their restaurant. And um, Wingstop having more of a chicken wing, obviously they sell the same product. So throughout the finance section, you will see that these different company structures, Dave & Buster's being more company owned and Wingstop being more franchised, will have effects on uh, the different financial statements and ratios. We also want to draw your attention to the sales and revenue line on the income statement. There are some interesting things going on with Buffalo Wild Wings. 
with franchises versus company-owned restaurants, and we just want, we'll talk about it a little more later, but we just wanted to point you out to the revenues versus, or in-store revenues versus franchise royalty revenues. We also want to direct your attention to the balance sheet with the current assets and current liabilities. These numbers will keep coming up in the ratios, and they have a great effect on the um, different finances. We're going to start with looking at short-term liquidity ratios. These will be the ratios that we fund our programmatic recommendation through. We're going to start with the current ratio. Uh, most notably here, you'll see that Buffalo Wild Wings has been trending downward from 2014 to 2016. This is because they have been buying back common stock. Additionally, Dave & Buster's has been trending downward because they've been paying off debt. Um, in 2015 to 2016, you'll see that all three companies are turning downward, and an external factor that could play a part in this is that this was around the timing of the Chipotle E. coli outbreak, um, where they just kind of created a general food scare in the chicken industry, and so all these companies providing chicken products uh, could have impacted that. Buffalo Wild Wings quick ratio, again we see a dip between the years 2014 and 2015. This is due to a couple of the factors that Kelsey mentioned, primarily buying back of common stock as well as buying back franchises and turning them into company owned restaurants. Analyzing the attributes of the cash ratio, there's some unique stuff going on here. Buffalo Wild Wings has been trending down recently because they've been buying back, or excuse me, buying franchise owned restaurants to become company owned restaurants. They've also been buying back common stock, about 200, 300, and 400 million dollars, uh, respectively, over the past two or three years. And then looking at Wingstop, they have an interesting dip because over the past year or so, they started paying out cash dividends to st stockholders. So the liquidity ratios in the long term include total debt ratio and debt to equity ratio. Uh, as you can see from this graph, Buffalo Wild Wings and Dave & Buster's are right around the industry average. But Wingstop, it's important to notice, is taking a lot of debt on in 2015, and so that's why they rose so rapidly. And with respect to debt to equity ratio, uh, you'll notice that Wingstop is kind of the outlier here, and this is because from 2013 to 2014 they had a net operating loss, and then in 2015 they actually issued their IPO, which kind of caused them to skyrocket in that area. Moving into the asset management ratios, these ratios are generally utilized to help determine how well a company is managing that its assets. There are a few here that are specific to the food industry, which we'll talk about. So looking at Buffalo Wild Wings inventory turnover, we see them here between Dave & Buster's and Wingstop. They hold their inventory a little bit longer than Wingstop for two reasons. One is because they have more inventory to begin with, and two, because they freeze a lot of their foods that aren't vegetables or items that need to be hold, or held fresh, rather. So for total asset turnover, uh, you can see Buffalo Wild Wings is well above the industry. This is because they actually have a lot, uh, or very high sales, and they have a, a fairly normal amount of assets. Uh, Buffalo, or Dave & Buster's and Wingstop are more uh, down around the industry average. Looking at the receivables turnover, Buffalo Wild Wings and Wingstop are sort of right in the same area here, but Dave & Buster's has a very unique drop because prior to their IPO in 2015, the years leading up to that, they were mostly cash-based sales company opposed to issuing credit. So in 2013, when they were preparing for their IPO, they started uh, working with receivables. So that explains this significant drop. And so for day sales and receivables, you can see Buffalo Wild Wings and Dave & Buster's are trending along the same lines. But Wingstop is actually um, above that because they extend credit for longer. Um, and so they obviously don't get uh, paid from their receivables as quickly. Looking at the day sales and inventory, this is unique because Buffalo Wild Wings is actually a little above the industry average. The industry average is about seven days, Buffalo Wild Wings is about 11, and you want that to be generally under a week in the food industry because you're working with perishables. However, Dave & Buster's is extremely high, they're at about 40 days. This is because they're more focused on the environment and the fun game-like atmosphere they have, opposed to the food, so they're not really focusing on the freshness and quality of their food as much. We're going to look at food cost margin. This is a ratio that is specific to the food industry. Um, notably here, you'll see that Buffalo Wild Wings is kind of right around that 30 um, cent to the dollar mark, and that's right on industry average. Uh, with Wingstop being such an outlier, that is simply just because there's a lack of information on their financial statements. Um, so they kind of have their line item as cost of goods sold rather than dividing it into cost of food um, like the other two companies. So now look at profitability ratios. Uh, this includes profit margin, return on assets, and return on equity. So profit margin is very important to a company, obviously. Buffalo Wild Wings has a slightly declining profit margin, and Wingstop actually has a very good profit margin because they have such low overhead, and their operations are very simple, and so they don't have to um, expend as much on that. 
Looking at profit margin in contrast to revenue, you'll see that revenues have steadily been increasing while profit margins have uh, been at a downward slope since 2014. This is because in 2014, that was when they started buying back those franchise locations. So that's a huge capital investment for them. Buffalo Wild Wings return on assets has remained relatively stable over the course of the last five years. Wingstop, though, we noticed a jump between 2015 and 2016. This is primarily due to the fact that they have really low overhead. Their total assets are significantly smaller in comparison to Buffalo Wild Wings compared to the amount of net income that they're pulling in specifically within the last couple of years. Observing the return on equity slide, Wingstop has a very unique thing here. Uh, basically, prior to their IPO in 2015, they were working with a net operating loss. So that explains why they have a negative return on equity. While Buffalo Wild Wings and Dave and & Buster's are sort of about the same. So the price ratios and market value include price to earnings ratio and stock price history. So for the price to earnings ratio, uh, we only have information on Dave & Buster's and Wingstop for 2015 because they uh, issued their IPO in 2015. Uh, as you can see, they all uh, end around the industry average uh, in 2016. But Dave & Buster's takes quite a dip because their price per share was remaining relatively the same, but their earnings per share was skyrocketing. Concluding with our stock price, uh, our stock price history. As of this morning, the stock price was about $158. You can see that Buffalo Wild Wings has had a pretty significant growth, but in the past two or three years, it's steadied out as they have been buying back common stock and also company or franchises to become company-owned restaurants. And then, lastly, is our financials overview. We have found that the ratios are steady. Um, they have recently dipped about dipped, but it's not unmanageable for a company like Buffalo Wild Wings. They have some debt, again, but it's not a manual. One could argue that taking on debt for growth is healthy for a company. And through our short-term liquidity ratios, utilizing all three, we believe Buffalo Wild Wings can fund our programmatic recommendation. Looking at Buffalo Wild Wings operations, they have around 1,200 physical restaurant locations. About half of these are franchised and about half of them are company owned. They have around 45,000 employees overall and about 72% of these are part-time employees, which represents a significant amount of their workforce. They're currently headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota, having moved there from Cincinnati in 1994. And they also own companies R Taco and Pizza Rev, which are a fast casual Mexican restaurant, and build your own pizza establishment, respectively. This is the product pie. Looking at this, this is just explaining how 80% of Buffalo Wild Wings revenues are coming from traditional wings, boneless wings, and then non-alcoholic beverages while the remaining 20% are coming from alcoholic beverages and then other menu items. Continuing the product revenue, this explains why Buffalo Wild Wings would be interested in buying franchises to attain control. So currently, Buffalo Wild Wings has about 50-50 company-owned restaurants versus franchise-owned restaurants. So you can see that 95% of the sales are coming from 50% of the restaurants, while the other 5% of sales is coming from the other 50% of the restaurants. And with respect to domestic operations, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings has 1,187 locations within the U.S. These are primarily concentrated in the Midwest, as that was where the company was started, as well as where their headquarters are. Uh, for 2017, they have pretty lofty expansion goals to have 15 new franchise locations and 15 new company-owned locations. So we want to speak on the global uh, operations. This is actually out of the scope of our study, but we wanted to touch on the fact that they have some... Uh, company-owned restaurants in Canada, which is close by, easy to manage, and then they have a few uh, franchise restaurants in places like Mexico and the uh, Middle East. They have very aggressive expansion goals, and they actually um, have seen an expansion opportunity in the Middle East and Asia because of the sports fans that they can capitalize on there. This is a quote from Sally Smith, the CEO, that's just sort of talking about going global. Uh, it's basically saying how even as they're growing and growing into different countries, they still want to stay true to their roots, which is this fan-like atmosphere and the sports following that they have. Um, in 2012, Buffalo Wild Wings entered into a contract with McLean Company, who oversees all of their uh, supply chain and distribution needs. Um, so they have a very centralized approach to this. Uh, specifically, McLean Company uh, encompasses their food, beverage, uh, and packaging goods, as well as logistics and inventory and all of that. Um, and it's been able to secure a hedging contract for their chicken, which Andrew will touch on. 
So looking at chicken wing costs, they're based primarily on the prior month's wings market. And so there's a couple of different factors that influence this from chicken feed to trade agreements. Um, so we'll touch on those a little bit later. But so their hedging contract that they have set up with McLean Company Inc. is meant to hedge any sort of significant increase or decrease in chicken prices. This is meant to protect both Buffalo Wild Wings as well <coughs> as McLean Company from any sort of significant uh, change or fluctuation in these prices here. And franchises have become an important part of the business. Uh, obviously, half, almost half of the stores are franchised. And so they have a minimum area development of five stores. This is to create centralized communication with the franchise owners. They also have ongoing training and quality control in the franchises. This is to make sure that everyone is getting that Buffalo Wild Wings pure experience and the atmosphere that each store has. Looking at the strategic alliances Buffalo Wild Wings is working with, one of their main strategic alliances is the NCAA. They are the specific uh, sponsor of 23 colleges and universities, specifically some of the big ones such as Michigan, Duke, and Alabama. Also, they are partnered with Learfield and IMG, which are both sports marketing agencies. Learfield is more at the collegiate level, and they manage about 120, uh, or the media for about 120 colleges or sports, sports divisions at colleges, while IMG is more of the distribution part of the media, and they also work with individuals in sports marketing. So overall, uh, the operations, Buffalo Wild Wings has some aggressive expansion goals domestically and, um, and globally. They want to organize and take advantage of their franchises especially, and they want to maintain that distribution contract with McLean, which is vital to their business. They also want to utilize and capitalize on their strategic alliances such as the NCAA and continue to leverage those. Looking at Buffalo Wild Wings external analysis, these are the factors that can't be controlled by the company, such as macroeconomic factors, and so we'll break those down for you. The first part of this external analysis that we want to address is Buffalo Wild Wings direct competitors. So just to reiterate, um, we've identified Dave and Buster's and Wingstop as two primary competitors, being that Dave and Buster's provides a unique restaurant experience that complements their product offerings, as well as Wingstop provides similar product offerings to Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, three others that we want to point out are Applebee's, Hooters, and BJ's as they offer similar product offerings and provide an atmosphere where customers can watch sports if they wish. Transitioning to indirect competitors, through our research we found that stores and then also multimedia outlets were a unique aspect to being their indirect competitors. While Buffalo Wild Wings has shown to have been successful even in the midst of a tumultuous economy because it's cheaper to go to Buffalo Wild Wings than it is to an actual game, people may be more inclined to stay at home and watch the game with family and friends or order off Amazon Fresh and go buy food from local stores and cook it themselves. So the customer that Buffalo Wild Wings targets is obviously sports fans who are passionate. They know that they are volatile and price sensitive, but they're looking for people who want a game day experience and that's why uh, people come into Buffalo Wild Wings. So this uh, quote shows that even during a downturn in the economy, people love that atmosphere so much and the stadium feel of Buffalo Wild Wings that they'll still come and give their hard-earned dollars to Buffalo Wild Wings. This is just a sort of complementary aspect or additional aspect to Buffalo Wild Wings and the people who go to Buffalo Wild Wings, odds are, are going to be interested in fantasy sports as well. Some of the big platforms that have to do with fantasy sports are FanDuel, DraftKings. These are two membership-based uh, platforms where you have to pay to be part of them while ESPN and Yahoo are free platforms. And to give some more uh, background information on fantasy leagues as an industry, in 2016 there were 57.4 million players, um, so a lot of people are involved in that. Additionally, since 1988, they've seen over an 11,000 percent growth, which is just exponential in that area. Another thing to note that um, in fantasy leagues as of 2016, uh, there's about 60 percent of men involved and 40 percent of women involved. Also, this $556 on league-related fees relates to, or converts to about $6 billion, so it's a very lucrative industry. So a couple of technological factors that we want to bring up for you are specifically in regards to distribution and payment. So a couple of new factors within the last couple of years have been companies like DoorDash, Uber Eats, Deliveroo, and Postmates, where customers can sit at home and have the same restaurant food, but in the comfort of their home. Um, and so this is something for Buffalo Wild Wings to keep in mind, particularly because their unique competitive advantage is in their restaurant environment. And so as customers start ordering more online, this poses a potential threat to their organization. Also, as we talked about earlier, in regards to using tablets in table ordering and um, data capture in that regard, um, Buffalo Wild Wings has capitalized on this and continues to look for ways to implement new data capture technologies. 
concluding with our macroeconomic factors, we have economic health and then society's health concerns. These are the two we want to focus on. So as we mentioned, Buffalo Wild Wings has done well, even in the midst of a downturn economy. But still, if something worse were to happen, as we have seen in the past, uh, people may be more inclined to stay home and with the tighter budget, going out to eat probably isn't on their priorities. Next is society's health concerns. With all kinds of new medical technology coming out and it seems like there's a new diet trending every day, people are going to be more inclined to maybe not go out to Buffalo Wild Wings if they're trying to be on a diet or they're easily influenced by some of these diets. So as we wrap up the situational analysis, we're going to transition into a SWOT analysis. Um, so just to reiterate, a situational analysis is an objective look at kind of the internal and external factors facing Buffalo Wild Wings. And the SWOT analysis is um, a subjective analysis of those uh, that content from the situational analysis. So just want to uh, portray what this will be. Uh, the strengths and weaknesses that we'll look at are all internal factors, and then we'll transition into opportunities and threats, which are all from external factors. So our analysis here is defined, again, by our definition of sustainable competitive advantage. So just a reminder of how we defined that earlier, as an asset or quality that is difficult to duplicate is not easily changed over time and creates more buyer value over competitors. And this is typically modeled in niche <coughs> markets with lower sales volume and higher profit margins. So we'll begin with our strengths. Obviously, as we mentioned before, the operations and distribution of McLean is a huge strength as far as combating rising chicken costs. Um, and they give such a centralized approach to supply chain management that it helps the company uh, communicate with them. Sally Smith, her skills as a leader are also a very strong strength for the company. Sally Smith has been the leader of the company for almost or a little over 20 years. She has experience in finance, and she has arguably helped bring the company from the small company it was to the public company it is today. Looking at the strategic alliance with the NCAA, this is a specific competence for Buffalo Wild Wings from the strategic partnerships that they have with colleges, providing these college hangout experiences at their restaurants and collegiate towns, as well as sponsorship of events like March Madness and other NCAA related tournaments. A fan can be someone who, or can be defined as someone who is enthusiastically devoted to something or somebody. So we recognize that a lot of Buffalo Wild Wings customers or their primary customers are sports fans. They're people who are enthusiastically devoted to various sports and various teams, and in the same way, they're enthusiastically devoted to their sports viewing experience. And so with that kind of customer base, Buffalo Wild Wings has a loyalty in that fan-like following. Also is the unique customer experience Buffalo Wild Wings provides. When you go into Buffalo Wild Wings, it's different than most restaurants. You're going to have dozens of screens there. Everyone's there for the same reason, enjoying the food, but also enjoying the sports and the fan-like atmosphere they provide. The waiters and the staff are also there. They, everyone has the jerseys on, and it's a very fun atmosphere. And transitioning into weaknesses. So we mentioned that Sally Smith is a strength in the sense that her skills are a strength. However, we also want to recognize that um, the fact that leadership is so centralized under her is a weakness. Um, it's not a coincidence that throughout the presentation, uh, the majority of the quotes that you've seen are from her. Uh, she's kind of the public figure for the company, and anything that they publish has a quote from Sally Smith on it. So while she's a good leader, uh, we recognize that there's a little bit of vulnerability in the fact that leadership is so centralized under her. Another weakness we want to point out for you guys is in regards to their website user interface. So we'll take you to a screenshot here of their homepage from a couple weeks ago. So if you direct your attention to the upper left hand corner where they have their navigation bar, they have all of their products listed, um, their menu, and then immediately adjacent to that is their promotions. Now these are primarily sales based discount promotions, which is a process that we don't believe from our definition is sustainable nor an advantage for Buffalo Wild Wings in the long run. So, uh, continuing with the weaknesses, there's uh, asymmetry of goals between the leadership and some non-controlling interests. Uh, we can see that if, not, if both companies' desires aren't being fulfilled, obviously this is going to be a weakness for the company. And then, even though training is a specific strength for Buffalo Wild Wings in the areas of recruiting, <coughs> hiring, and employee retention, they are weak in comparison to the rest of their industry. They have a particularly high employee turnover rate, and as such, their labor costs have been increasing within the last couple of years. So as far as opportunities go, they want to further leverage their strategic alliances and they see more uh, different strategic alliances as far as professional sports go. So they see uh, a move into that market. <coughs> they also might see a move into uh, the fantasy sports market because that is a lucrative market for them. 
An additional external factor uh, that could be a great opportunity for Buffalo Wild Wings is to continue to leverage technology. Um, so we see that the world is becoming more technologically advanced and there's a lot of opportunities to um, create customer loyalty through CRM databases and further enhancing their Buffalo Circle um, thing that they have now. Additionally, uh, kind of improving upon <coughs> distribution technology to be able to make their processes more efficient and cost effective. Also, we have the enhancing the female fan base. Right now, Buffalo Wings, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings' pr primary target market is men and families, but women compose up about 50% of fans of the major sports leagues out there, and they also are responsible for about 45% of all NFL official gear purchases. So this is an opportunity that Buffalo Wild Wings definitely should consider pursuing. Next is our threats with rising chicken costs. Uh, rising chicken costs is a huge threat because it's their primary uh, primary product that they sell. With uh, a recent A1 avian flu outbreak in Georgia, there have been a decrease in chicken. Also, there's talk about pulling out of a Trans-Pacific trade deal, which, re which results in uh, dealing with trade with agri agricultural trade with other countries. And then also, there is a recent uh, feed outbreak issue in Argentina, which negatively affected both last year and then the beginning part of this year. Further, there are also other uh, restaurants such as McDonald's experience experimenting with Wild Wings. So whenever you have this supply and demand imbalance, there's gonna be a price uh, increase or decrease. Local sports team success is also a threat for Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, when, people, when people's sports teams aren't playing well, they're not gonna wanna go out to their local Buffalo Wild Wings to go watch the game because they just don't wanna see their team lose. <laughs> and so that could really like, affect their uh, traffic coming into the out of the restaurant. An additional threat for them is that Buffalo Wild Wings is positioned in uh, an industry where customers have a lot of choice power. There's a lot of restaurants where you can choose to go, and even though Buffalo Wild Wings does provide a unique experience, customers in this area are generally price sensitive and volatile just because they're enabled through the amount of choice power that they have in being set in the restaurant industry. Another threat that we mentioned briefly earlier is with Mercado Capital Management Group. They hold the 5% minority investment stake within the company and they actually have a website that's dedicated to suggestions for improvements to Buffalo Wild Wings corporate leadership strategy. So while this is sort of an ongoing piece to our study, uh, it's something for Buffalo Wild Wings to be wary of because it has the potential to sort of uproot some of the trust that they have with their investors. And so we want to apply our opportunities to the new sources of staying competitive advantage. We see the strategic alliances as a new source for this as far as moving into professional sports and possibly fantasy sports and continuing to leverage further the NCAA sponsorship that we have. And if you remember from our definition of sustainable competitive advantage, it's something that's difficult to duplicate. Um, and so we see it then being able to further leverage that unique customer following and unique customer experience that they offer in the sense that um, it's something that's difficult to duplicate and it's unique to their company. So over the course of our study throughout the semester, there are a couple different programmatic recommendations that we considered. We're going to show you two options that didn't make the final cut, um, but with viable alternative number one, we're looking at a program for employee retention, particularly in the area of human resource management. As we talked about a little earlier, Buffalo Wild Wings has a huge uh, employee turnover rate, I think one of the largest in the industry. So this viable alternative, the idea was that we could help motivate frontline employees and improve uh, employee retention, specifically at the store or restaurant level. The thought behind this was we could mimic sort of a Starbucks model who has partnered with ASU to utilize their online degree programs. Uh, also maybe potentially working with a tuition discount plan for uh, frontline employees, we thought this would help them stay longer, but then we also could help utilize those employees to potentially move them up into corporate positions. And so there are pros and cons to every program, of course. Uh, one of the pros that we saw in this program was that the Buffalo Wild Wings could advance their graduate employees to corporate positions. This really comes back to leveraging the intellectual capital and moving the employees further up in the system. Uh, in contrast, a con to this program would be uh, just the general cost of the program. Um, anytime you invest in employees, it's going to cost the company, um, specifically in the area of tuition repayment or discounts. Um, that is just a big cost for them. Additionally, another con is that uh, there's a risk in losing student workers long term. So while this, uh, pro or this viable alternative has been fully thrown out because it's not our programmatic recommendation, there would likely be some kind of contract where if you are an applicant that is getting um, tuition uh, discount or tuition repayment, um, there would be a commitment to work for the company for a certain amount of time. However, uh, you can't ensure that those employees would stay forever. Our second viable alternative realizes the advantage that Buffalo Wild Wings has on uh, other restaurants as far as their atmosphere goes and how they create such a good uh, stadium kind of presence in their stores. 
Yeah, so we want to be able to bring that experience that, that they provide in restaurant and bring it outside <coughs> the walls of Buffalo Wild Wings to um, further their customer following and build more fans of the restaurant. And so um, the idea here is to partner with those college hangouts that they are already aligned with. So they have 23 college uh, hangout partnerships, as Cameron mentioned previously, and the idea here is for Buffalo Wild Wings wing trucks um, to uh, come and uh, host tailgates of sorts um, at these college hangouts. So you'll notice a mock-up here of what these wing trucks might look like um, as far as how they would kind of create that atmosphere outside the walls of the restaurants. Reviewing the pros of this, the first one would be increased brand awareness. Whenever you have a bright yellow truck, truck with wings sticking out of it and a Buffalo Wild Wings logo on it, odds are people are going to notice it and people are going to be more inclined to go to Buffalo Wild Wings. Also, they're going to be able to capitalize on their college and fanatical following. Since they have sort of this mobile restaurant, they can take the restaurant experience and the customer experience they have, bring it out of the restaurant, they could go to these colleges and universities we were talking about, but then they could also go to the actual stadium or other places to have this restaurant experience. Some of the cons for this viable alternative in particular regard advertising equipment and then sort of the logistical and operational costs of it. Um, so the advertising and equipment budgets wouldn't be able to be pulled from any sort of budget that Buffalo Wild Wings already has in place. So there's an additional expenditure there that's going to cut into your profit margins, at least for the time being. Um, also in regards to just operations, logistically, you'd have to set up a separate staff for each of these different trucks. And if you're looking to roll that out, large scale, you're going to need to have a significant amount of capital and human resource management sort of devoted to that. We're going to transition into some minor recommendations. So these are minor recommendations that uh, would need to be fulfilled in order to uh, better further the programmatic recommendation that we will reveal soon and just general minor recommendations that we think would be beneficial to the company as a whole. So the first that I want to address um, is to have a succession plan for Sally Smith. So this has been touched on a couple times um, in her leadership being a strength, but the fact that it is centralized under her creates a significant amount of vulnerability for the company. And so a minor recommendation would be to have a succession plan for her um, just in the case of an emergency or if she were to step down. Um, unexpectedly for some reason um, they just need to have kind of an estimate of other applicants um, or other executives and VPs that could potentially take her place. Second would be renewing the hedging contract with McLean uh, as we already talked about chicken prices and other uh, commodities can be volatile sometimes so making sure that they're able to lock in their chicken prices or at least have a good idea of what their future chicken prices could be would benefit the company both short term and going forward in the long term. So after a semester's worth of focus study and environmental monitoring and scanning, uh, we have come upon our programmatic recommendation, which is the strategy that we recommend for Buffalo Wild Wings in the form of our Fantasy Wings program. So this is specifically a marketing alliance, a strategic alliance partnership plan with a fantasy platform. So some more background um, on this recommendation is that um, it would be something that would allow Buffalo Wild Wings to further press into that niche market of those sports enthusiasts who are um, fan-like in their sports experience as well as to the restaurant. Additionally, um, with the leagues that you specifically buy in, the statistic in the past year was that the median household income was $75,000. So it shows little price sensitivity for those that are involved in fantasy leagues. This is just sort of a depiction of what the plan would look like. We have it broken, out, broken up into three phases and five steps within those phases. We'll explain in a little more detail, but sometimes the visual representation just helps picture where everything will be. The first uh, phase would be developing the alliance, and within that step would be determining the alliance strategy. So the biggest part of that would be determining how to fund the strategic alliance. Uh, we determined that utilizing the short-term liquidity ratios would be the best option by utilizing all three of them. Buffalo Wild Wings is able to distribute that risk over all three, so if there was some external uh, emergency that they needed to access cash or liquidate inventory, they could do that quickly without having to worry about not being able to fund this plan. Additionally, I just want to reiterate that this would be a non-equity strategic alliance. So our recommendation is for a strategic alliance partnership plan. So we'll be rolling out this plan that we'd recommend to Buffalo Wild Wings in order for them to find a strategic alliance that would enable them to engage in a non-equity marketing alliance. So the second step would be selecting a partner. This is up to Buffalo Wild Wings, but there are partners like FanDuel and ESPN who might be ideal for them. They want a fantasy sports company that would be good in a, or already has a presence in a unique uh, niche market, 
and they want that strength in the, the niche market to uh, really boost the company, both companies, in uh, their, what they're trying to do. So as far as structuring the alliance and the marketing alliance piece of this, we're looking to split the advertising spend between Buffalo Wild Wings and the fantasy platform that they end up choosing. 51% Buffalo Wild Wings and 49% to the fantasy platform. This is to maintain a controlling interest for Buffalo Wild Wings so that they have a little bit more emphasis on the messaging that's being put out. Also is a non-compete clause. Though small, it's important to protect both Buffalo Wild Wings and the other company we're partnering with, or Buffalo Wild Wings is partnering with. This is important, uh, so both companies, if one company decides to go off and create a similar strategic alliance that can negatively affect Buffalo Wild Wings, they can't do that with the non-compete clause. And we're looking to compose this ad budget and campaign from the advertising budget that Buffalo Wild Wings already has in place. So we're looking primarily for brand awareness here, and then we'll be including response motivators within the campaign to encourage revenue income from customers that are impacted by the campaign overall. So once uh, Buffalo Wild Wings kind of goes through these first few phases and establishes a strategic alliance, they have to manage that marketing alliance. And so uh, the foremost way to do this would be through access codes that you'll see a mock-up of in a minute. Um, but access codes that would be utilized on the tablets that are already in place at Buffalo Wild Wings. This would be um, so that Buffalo Wild Wings can uh, measure the amount of people who are coming into the restaurants uh, through those Fantasy League marketing tools. Additionally, um, they'd be access codes that provide an incentive for those Fantasy League participants through the platform of whoever they would choose. Additionally, um, this marketing alliance would uh, be primarily through social media advertising as it is measurable and you can see um, how many people are engaging with those ads. So here we have a couple mock-ups for what the campaign would look like on a social media platform. So the mock-up you see far to the left is on Facebook's platform, and when a user would click on it, either on a desktop platform or mobile device, they'd be directed to our Fantasy Wings landing page, and then they would click through and fill out some of their personal information as well as their fantasy sports preferences in order for Buffalo Wild Wings to capture a little bit more what drives them and their fantasy sports background so that we can get them plugged in immediately when they come into the restaurant. This is sort of that fantasy portal uh, that you would plug the access code in and then also your name and other information that would be on this tablet within the restaurant. And so the fifth step would be reevaluating the alliance. We, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings would want to look at the success of the alliance and the success probabilities after we've rolled it out in a small test area and see if, we're achieving, or if they're achieving the goals that they set, then determine next steps and see if Buffalo Wild Wings wants to continue the relationship with the fantasy sports company or terminate it. Looking at the suite of metrics, we have qualitative and quantitative factors. Qualitative factors consist of looking at how well the alliance and the collaboration with the two companies is going. Are they willing to work together more? Are they willing to sort of cross company lines and collaborate together? Those are all important decisions to take into consideration, but also goals. If the companies are having different goals or their goals change along the line, this can negatively affect the plan and the strategic alliance. As far as quantitative factors for the campaign go, we're looking primarily at revenue over time, and we'll be measuring this directly resulting from the campaign through the access codes that we provide to each of the individual customers that come through our social media advertising efforts. So further in this discussion on the suite of metrics, as I mentioned before, um, there would be access codes in place um, in the restaurant experience that would help Buffalo Wild Wings measure how many people are coming in through those Fantasy League marketing efforts um, and also help that uh, strategic alliance, the Fantasy League platform, to be able to uh, metrically understand how many people are engaging in the leagues through a Buffalo Wild Wings location. They would also want to have mid-season league check-ins, so that means that they would see how many customers would show, were showing up every week and use customer satisfaction surveys in the apps to um, actually understand the customer a little better and see what they want and what they don't want. Additionally, the marketing efforts would be primarily social media, um, which allows the companies to um, measure who, how many people are interacting and engaging uh, with those <coughs> platforms. For example, the video that you saw on the Facebook mock-up, um, Facebook allows you to see how many people have viewed that um, and really engage with that ad. So we're looking to roll it out in part of a small test area, um, primarily in the areas of Columbus, Ohio, where the first Buffalo Wild Wings location is, and then also in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where our corporate headquarters are, and this is in order to stimulate maximum communication between the test team on the ground with the corporate offices. Buffalo Wild Wings and the partner would also want to adjust the product or the alliance, sort of parallel to phase three of this uh, program we have set up. 
in this phase, we are in this uh, part, we would determine, or Buffalo Wild Wings would determine how well the alliance is going and how the product is structured. Also, do they need to change or differ, differ anything to utilize any other resources? <coughs> and then they would move forward in the masses and launch this product uh, across all the stores and locations, or they would tweak the alliance, or if worse came to worse, terminate the alliance. So some of the expected outcomes, they want to focus on a niche market. Uh, this is very important because it, it's important to create profit margin in a small, unique setting instead of a, a large setting. Additionally, another expected outcome would be to advance customer perceived value. So this opportunity to uh, kind of engage with fantasy sports through the restaurant location is a value added service uh, for Buff Buffalo Wild Wings uh, customers. And so they'd be able to kind of capitalize on that customer perceived value and remain or retain those uh, higher prices than their competitors. More expected outcomes would be uh, <coughs> Buffalo Wild Wings want to strengthen their brand image by partnering with this one of these fantasy companies, they could not only strengthen uh, the brand image of the fantasy company, but their own, and boost, both of those could boost them, uh, each company. They also want to eliminate seasonal revenue dips, uh, since professional sports go year-round and there's fantasy platforms for most of the uh, major sports, they would uh, create an animal, a annual customer uh, for their, their store. Moving forward into areas for future study, this Mercado Capital uh, active investor, which we talked about a little bit, is just there's so much going on to it, and it felt like throughout this uh, course of this semester, every time a big presentation was released or something was released in the media or the press, it was either shortly before one of our presentations where we couldn't take time to adjust for it and put it in the, new, the current presentation, or right after, which was too late to put in the presentation at all. So there's so much depth to it and there's so much going on that it would really be an area for future semesters. Another area for future study is specifically regarding in-store fantasy customization. So Eric talked a little bit about this earlier, but in-app we'll be having surveys and then getting feedback from both the customers as well as the restaurant employees to determine the efficiency of this on the ground with the frontline staff. Yeah, so that concludes uh, the business portion of this presentation. So now we're going to kind of take off our strategic management hats and put on our Biola student hats and just get to talk about the spiritual implications of this semester and this study. Uh, so at the beginning of this semester, our team created a learning team charter, um, kind of just talking through how we would handle various situations and specifically choosing a few Bible verses to guide how we would interact with one another. So the first one I want to touch on is Proverbs 27, 17. That talks about iron sharpening iron. Um, we recognize that each of us have um, different concentrations, different experiences, and therefore we bring different skill sets, strengths and weaknesses, and perspectives to the table. And so uh, we really just want to utilize one another um, to sharpen each other. Additionally, Philippians 2.3 uh, talks about being humble um, and not do, looking to do anything out of selfish ambition. And so um, our team has really tried to keep a perspective of a willingness to learn, always wanting to learn from one another um, and kind of put ourselves aside um, and our selfish ambition aside and um, just get to learn from the things that each of us have learned over the years. One of the biggest impacts that this humility that Kelsey's talking about has had on our group has been in our consensus driven group structure. So understanding that each of us brings a, our own valid opinion to the table and that we all have different sort of specialties that we were working with. Um, we all made decisions together. Um, there wasn't any decision that we made throughout the course of the semester, whether it be regarding our programmatic recommendation or any specific way that we presented on a topic that wasn't agreed on by all of us. And that helped us better understand the topic as well as better understand each other in the group <coughs> and work together more effectively. And there was not a ton of conflict in our group, but when their conflict resolution came, we decided that we want to communicate with each other so we could better understand each other's opinions and move forward and progress. And that way we would know, hey, like, Andrew's thinking this way, and so, so I have to act this way or kind of, like, go with what he's saying. And it, it just helps with all, any argument or little thing we have. And lastly is the big question, what would we do? So when it comes to working for the company, long term, we would say yes. This Mercado Capital thing, there's a lot going on, as we already mentioned, and there's all kinds of things we're not sure about yet. But it's an issue that can be overcome, and long term, we would work for the company. Short term, though, because of the Mercado Capital, it's drawing out a lot of uh, issues and concerns within Buffalo Wild Wings, so that's why we wouldn't work for them currently. Would we invest in the company? Again, for the same reasons. Currently, we would not invest in the company because of the Mercado Capital, and it's hard to predict what would happen long term with this Mercado Capital and the share price or the stock price of Buffalo Wild Wings. So we believe investing in the company currently, we would not be wise stewards of God's money. 
Thank you for taking the time to view our presentation. Panelists, Dr. Sherwin, and anyone watching online, we are Buffalo Wild Wings. Wings. Beer. Sports. <laughs> <laughs> So let me make sure I just, I've got what your recommendation is. So you have a $1 million test, is that what I understand, of this fantasy sports uh, strategic partnership? Correct, yeah. So we'd be partnering with a fantasy sports platform, and then we'd be implementing their app within our restaurants using some of these access codes that we talked about to measure sort of their effectiveness. And then the advertising is just sort of the promotional efforts, because it's all working with existing technologies that we have on our end at Buffalo Wild Wings, as well as if we're partnering with ESPN or DraftKings there. But we're also recommending the plan of it itself. Right, so that's the start, that's the seed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about the legal implications of some of these fantasy sports like FanDuel and uh, other ones who are having some pretty significant legal issues right now and maybe moral and ethical as well? Yes, um, yes. that is definitely something that we have uh, discussed um, as a group and even in developing this recommendation. Um, and so a big part of that is kind of just remembering that the recommendation is a plan for Buffalo Wild Wings to be able to figure out who that partner would be rather than advising they specifically partner with DraftKings as a buy-in league, for example. Um, additionally, uh, it's just a marketing line, so that would be seeking to bring in uh, those that utilize fantasy leagues um, into the restaurant so that they can experience Buffalo Wild Wings and then become a fan of Buffalo Wild Wings itself. There wouldn't be any actual engagement in those buy-in leagues in store. And because we believe that the fantasy sports combos so well with what Buffalo Wild Wings is trying to do that when the people come in, they realize, hey, this is a great place for me to go and do fantasy sports, and then they'll keep coming back and create an annual customer. So one, one question with that would be, I mean, anybody can go on these uh, fantasy sports websites and connect directly. They don't need to go to Buffalo Wild Wings to do it. So what's the benefit to them doing it through Buffalo Wild Wings as opposed to just doing it on their own and then going and watching the games at Buffalo Wild Wings? Yes, yeah, so there would actually be incentives um, on those Fantasy League platforms uh, with those access codes. So not only do they help Buffalo Wild Wings kind of measure the amount of customers that are coming in through those marketing efforts, but there would be a two-edged side to that where uh, the Fantasy platform that Buffalo Wild Wings would partner with, um, there would be an incentive on their end as well. So for Customers, so, so if I was someone that involved was involved with the Fantasy League, I'd want to go into Buffalo Wild Wings um, because there would be an incentive for me to participate there, um, so there'd be a certain access code there. However, we haven't discussed that in huge detail as that is kind of beyond the scope of our actual recommendation as it was just a plan for Buffalo Wild Wings to find a strategic partner for Alliance. But would you get free chicken wings or free <laughs> drinks or free, I mean, how does that, something like that? Yeah. I mean, it's still out of the scope of our study. They would have to, they would have to come up with that plan, but uh, what we're recommending is a plan for the, the alliance. And kind of looking at partnering, kind of like Cameron talked about, with partnering with uh, this organization, working a little bit more collaboratively across company lines, um, looking for those solutions within the app to build like a, a platform that has login in integration that Kelsey's talking about in order to provide a specific Buffalo Wild Wings screen, whether or not that's us on our end also chipping in a little bit for um, data capture and providing sort of a digital experience that's on top of what they're experiencing just within that app to begin with. Is there a concern the other way that it would become more, you know, because like, I mean, I think about my wife, like thinking about uh, online, fan duel and all that being like almost a gambling type of thing and like now you're plugging in gambling to buffalo wild wings although it's not really gambling but it, yeah. it would have that appearance of so would that drive some customers away that say you know i'm just not going to go there because that whole fan duel thing and i mean i don't know again we're just recommend we're just uh, recommending the plan we're not recommending they use FanDuel or DraftKings, the gambling base. Someone like that. It could be ESPN and Yahoo are the free base sites that don't mm -hmm. do gambling. But yeah, we're not recommending, oh, use FanDuel or DraftKings because of gambling. We're, we've talked about that in our presentation, right? Yeah, there are some ethical issues with gambling, and they're currently going through some lawsuits and whatnot in the media. So that's specifically why we stayed away from recommending a specific uh, company. And because, don't, oh, go ahead. Don't, don't most uh, fantasy sports leagues, though, that whether they're 
profit based or not. You know, the participants can all throw some money in the pot. And, I mean, somebody's going to win something, right? You know, it's, it's a competitive thing. So that is that. Am I correct in that? Yeah, um, that's actually one of the things that we sort of discussed is that they're actually less price sensitive than the typical sports fan. Um, so that's kind of the specific advantage for Buffalo Wild Wings. We're not really looking to have any sort of revenue that we're deriving from the fantasy platform. It's just sort of an experience that we're adding as a value added service to the restaurant that encourages people to come and visit in restaurant. I think to tack on to that too, um, recognizing that half of the market being FanDuel and DraftKings are those buy-in leagues, but the other half is Yahoo and ESPN who are leagues that you don't have to buy into. So there is a market out there that isn't necessarily fully buying in um, to those things, but ultimately we're not recommending a specific company for them to work with, but we have discussed that before. And people, oh sorry, no, sir. And people throwing in money for pots is more of a personal preference thing that wouldn't be included in our plan. Sure, sure. Did, was there another question that you were finishing answering that I want to cut you off? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> was there some concern, I'm sorry, was there some concern that maybe this uh, alliance is going after customers we already have? Potentially, yeah. I think that is um, a big question, but I think further, um, we saw it more as a complementary thing, so rather than um, kind of competing in that area, there might be people who participate in fantasy leagues, but um, who haven't fully invested in a Buffalo Wild Wings experience, or maybe they, kind of what we said with our indirect competitors, maybe they fully participate in their fantasy leagues by watching those sports at home, but kind of through this, by leveraging those that are involved in fantasy leagues and bringing them into that in-store experience, it would kind of showcase something else that they could complement their fantasy league experience with. But I think a big part of that is further leveraging the niche market. So while there may be some crossover, ultimately at Buffalo Wild Wings really has a niche market in those sports fans and that fanatic following as does those who are involved in fantasy leagues because those are people who not only like sports but they've fully invested more time to have um, a draft in a league of their own and so I think we see them as complementary. There's also oh, go ahead Eric. Sorry. It would create a more loyal customer so maybe we have some of those customers but they just go every once off to Buffalo Wild Wings like hey today is the day that I want to go but uh, by creating like by this partnership you could create a customer that would come back and come back and come back and, cr and they're less price sensitive, so they would continue to spend money at the store. So I was gonna say there's the female fan base opportunity. There's a large uh, percentage of women that participate in fantasy sports, so we could, that'd be a way to try, uh, draw women into the restaurant too. Mm -hmm. I shift gears for a second and just go back to yeah, absolutely. Uh, some of what you guys talked about earlier. I was a little, I had a question because you, you guys talked about um, one of the things that Buffalo Wild Wings was doing was buying back franchises. Yeah. Yes. And so I'm a little confused, like we're buying back franchises, but now part of our new goal is to open 15 new franchises a year. Yeah. So, so why are we buying back franchises when we're part of our goal is to open new franchises? So this is sort of the whole Marcado capital thing. For the sake of our study, we were just continuing as if they're buying back franchises. When we started this study, their goal was to buy back uh, or buy franchises, and that's what they've been doing for the past several years. But then about a year or so ago, this Mercado Capital guy came in, and he wants people to he wants Buffalo Wild Wings to start franchising again. So we didn't want to go into too much detail on it because the Mercado Capital is beyond the scope of our study. But we sort of had to talk about it a little bit in order for uh, it to make sense with the whole why they're franchising a few stores again. So and that's their reasoning. The idea of Marcado had not evolved enough yet for us to actually do research on it and get a clear like description of what was happening, and so we just didn't want to touch it. I want to address that uh, because I've sat through a number of strategic reviews, and uh, one of them was uh, you know, a while ago on Chipotle. Chipotle stock had dropped 25 percent, and they were getting clobbered, and you know, the panel decided to leave it alone. It was like the elephant in the room. The Sparcato thing is a big deal. And so, you know, you can talk about, you know, hey, we're, we're, we've got our finger in the dike, you know, when we're getting, uh, you know, when we're, we're having a f an impending flood. Um, what I would look at those things for is, and the, here's my question. My question is, you know, really, the big picture, what is what is Mercado concerned about? 
you know, because you put up one of your strengths with Sally Smith, and they want her out. Um, you know, so I, I would at least address the major issues here. At the end of the day, I think like most activist investors, they just want to raise their investment. That's all they're after, and you know, so that's what. So they're they doing. must be disappointed on something other than just, all right, we're not seeing growth. They, they, I'm sure they pointed to the why. company was growing as we were sort of showing through the stock price, but also they were concerned with some of the board members and other things. But again, we didn't want to research it too much because sure. it's just beyond. But, the but you, but I, I could address the basics of saying, okay, your stock's down, you know, fifteen percent, yeah. which is a pretty big number. Why? One of the things too, we read some of their press releases from Marcado Capital Investment Group, and one of the things that sort of kicks in for me really was that Marcado believes that Buffalo Wild Wings is a profitable business, um, and so they believe in what Buffalo Wild Wings is doing. They're just seeing some inefficiencies within corporate leadership that they want to correct, and they even have come out and said that they're all for like the direction that the company is headed. They just don't think the company is headed in that direction quickly enough in comparison to competition. So some of the things there that they don't necessarily want Sally Smith out. They're not calling for a full board removal. They're right. looking for nominating two or three. I think it was board members They're trying to, watch um, some of to replace things. some of the board members right. that have shown a little bit less Correct. interest in growth. Correct. You um, showed she, she blended <coughs> in your SWOT analysis. She was a strength. Oh, she's a weakness. Yeah. 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 So to address that, her skills and her experience as a leader are a strength, but the fact that she's sort of the sole leader is a weakness. So her and herself isn't, she's not a weakness, right. but the fact that the company is sort of looking to Sally Smith as their only leader is the weakness. Yeah, kind of bouncing off of that, the whole idea of the centralized leadership, so she's a great leadership, but it's a big vulnerability in the case of an emergency or something where she would step down. There's just a huge lack of um, kind of plan in that and just a lot of the leadership is centralized under her. Additionally, if you remember from um, just our expected outcomes and minor recommendations, just kind of having this movement towards a contemporary organization structure. So wanting there to not be a top-down leadership structure where Sally Smith is kind of that centralized leader, but rather recommending that the company move towards a contemporary structure where then um, there wouldn't be such a vulnerability under Sally Smith or any CEO who was strong for that matter. I'm going to uh, stick with the uh, franchise buying back thing for a second. Um, help me understand why you didn't pursue that a little bit more aggressively as far as your recommendation. You've got 50% of your stores producing 90% of your uh, revenue and you've got the other 50 doing uh, nothing. What, that seems like a huge missed opportunity. Buy them all back. Figure out how to get that done. Why didn't you pursue that? We did pursue that actually a little bit um, when we first learned about Mercado and kind of what that was happening. That was actually a thought that we had for the recommendation and then um, kind of through the study um, just concluded that it was too volatile and it was literally changing things every single um, day or week and um, yeah, it just kind of landed that it was uh, something that we wouldn't be able to tackle with the resources that we have and the research methodology that we have. And so uh, <coughs> then it concluded that it would be an area for future study and something that um, would be super interesting to dive into um, if we had more time, but ultimately they just concluded that it was too volatile of a situation. And so uh, we kind of changed our course of direction and um, just chose to guide our study based on their strategy from the beginning, which was to buy back those franchise locations and then to bring up Mercado um, in the presentation as it's something that is really active right now, but leave it as an area for future study, just because it's changing um, rapidly each day and each week. And, and that's, is Mercado oh, kind of the tail wagging the dog a little bit? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, they just, it's a lot of proposed things. It's, it's, not like, it's not like these things were happening. It's a lot of proposed things. So as, as we created each presentation, they were all in parts. Uh, we couldn't tackle all those proposed things because nothing was set in stone yet. And that's one of the things, oh, um, just that Marcado has actually requested of Buffalo Wild Wings and kind of put forward is that the company move towards a franchising model because even though there's a little bit less profit that comes from it, it's less risky than owning a company owned restaurants and so some of the things that we talked about like volatility and chicken prices and some of the more material costs and assets and seeing um, even, um, what was it, like our, our assets versus net income, looking at Wingstop rising up in recent years, primarily because they are a franchising model, they're kind of trying to address some of those concerns well, there. Also, your franchises are outperforming your company stores. They have $1.9 billion in top line revenue. 
and they're less than 50%, you have 1.8 in your company on stores. So they have 5% of royalty. So, you know, there's a way to look at this mm -hmm. that maybe we're, the strategy is something that needs to be looked at. Buffalo Wild Wings definitely was seeking to uh, attain control by buying back common stock and then also buying those franchise restaurants. So they definitely noticed that that was their plan to get control, even though it may be a little more risky. I think to tack on to your question too, and what Eric mentioned was that a lot of um, what Mercado is doing is very hypothetical, um, and it was a lot of kind of just assumptions and different things that came out, and ultimately we kind of um, led that it would be an area for future study just because um, kind of the character to how things were happening was that there wasn't anything concrete that we could actually go off of, but as Andrew mentioned during the presentation, they actually have a website kind of um, speaking negatively towards Buffalo Wild Wings leadership, and it's a lot of kind of this, um, like in the air type of things. And so there wasn't really anything concrete to study. And it was just, as I said before, just too kind of volatile as a situation. Sorry, so, so we have about five minutes yep. left. So maybe a couple of uh, questions on a couple of different threads left. Yes, um, I, I want to make a comment first up. I thought that you know, your recommendations, whether we agree with them or not, which, uh, you know, that's always a that's always a tough one. You know, you've studied this more than we have, so we'll, we'll honor that. Uh, was really well, I mean, you, you guys dug much deeper than I've seen, so I thought that was really well done. Thank you. you. Know, so from that standpoint. Um, one thing when you were studying the, you know, where's the, the pro not where's the problem, where's, you know, where's the opportunity, did you consult any biblical solutions? As far as like, what, sorry, what do you mean? I don't understand. Really well, biblical solutions would be, uh, you know, looking, you know, the Bible isn't just answer questions of the soul. The Bible also, you know, there, there's a whole, organ, there are several organizations like C12 and Convene uh, that are uh, organizations where CEOs want to run their companies through biblical principles. And so when you look at, you know, excellence and growth and sustainability, there are a lot of answers that come from the scriptures on what to do and how to do that. And I'll give you one example. One example is what are, you know, some great companies, uh, you know, Ritz Carlton, Starbucks, others, and what is their number one focus? Employees. Bingo. So they find more sustainable growth. You know, you, we've all seen the problems with the airlines recently. That's because you've got some disgruntled employees along with, you know, with passengers. So where does it start and where can you focus on that? So that's just one example. Yeah. Lots of other examples, but um, that's why I was curious as to, you know, you're coming from Biola, you know, you're here for a reason to impact the world for Christ. So, you know, within, and that's what, you know, I want you to think about this in the future, when you start delving into solutions, you know, go to the scriptures and say, how how did Solomon handle this? He was a pretty rich guy, smart. I think one of the things that we kind of came to with that was our employee retention sort of viable alternative there. That's right. a kind of the big thing that we have there is our employees, many of them college students like us, are dissatisfied with leadership and they don't have a sense of sort of purpose within the company to the point that they, they want to stay long term. And so treating your employees well, treating them like you want to be treated yourself is kind of the, the purpose of that alternative. And the only reason why that didn't make it in is because the scope of that is really large and there's a lot of sort of uncertainty there too. And that would be applying Buffalo Wild Wings. Like, they say a lot of uh, stuff about employees and that would be like more pushing that forward and really putting a focus on that. You saw the quote earlier from Wait for Great. And so they, yeah. they do want those things, but I, the vibe all term was to push that farther, but the scope was too large for us. Can I ask about the relationship with McLean? Because, yeah. you know, we, we talked about how McLean's so great because they protect the chicken price or at least give them a buffer, you know, or something like that. But do we know the cost? That's kind of like wholesale distribution. So they're, you know, they're relying on this wholesale distributor for, you know, food product, which McLean doesn't do it for free. So McLean probably makes, the, you know, good good living sell, you know, running the food to Buffalo Wild Wings. Is there an opportunity somewhere in there to maybe look at 
doing your own distribution rather than leaning on an outside company that's probably making good money on what they're buying? It's true there is a markup for you know processing and handling fees and whatever, but um, McLean is just such a big part of their company that it would create so much turbulence if they didn't if they actually you know terminate that relationship and obviously creating their own you know distribution or whatever would be such a large uh, investment of their time and they'd have to hire new employees and put so much toward that that right now that's just not in the focus of what the company's after. And then additionally, that prior to 2012. Buffalo Wild Wings was working with individual distributors throughout the country, not just one. And they realized that if they worked with just one, they were looking for a company who could grow with them. And so they got into this contract with McLean and they've been growing with Buffalo Wild Wings. To tag on to that, if I remember the quote correctly, there's a quote that we read about um, kind of when they entered into that contract is that um, they were really excited about that opportunity because it took a lot of those thoughts and distribution thoughts out of their hands um, as McLean oversees 100% of their restaurants and kind of has centralized the whole process for the company. And so um, Buffalo Wild Wings specifically spoke about how they were excited to have McLean come on board with them so that they could complement another, one another as Buffalo Wild Wings continues to seek future growth. And so they see it really as um, a big asset to what they do. It just comes at a cost because mm -hmm. they kind of own you a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I if mean, McLean yeah. chooses to raise the price. I mean, what are they going to do if they don't? They don't have other alternatives. Yeah, I mean that's just kind of I guess how the world goes because in the same way you go to like a tax accountant sometimes. No, it doesn't. I mean in, in the same way you go to a tax accountant if they start raising their prices, I mean you can go look Find for someone else. Account. Yeah, so so you can go look for a distributor. But right now this seems to be working for the company, and so they'll continue in that until it obviously doesn't work, which is just how companies work. Have you guys seen the movie uh, The Founder during this? It was yeah. recent, recently released. So it was a story of Ray Kroc and McDonald's. You should definitely check that out because it would also give you some ideas about, you know, with this fast food chain, what how he made his money. And one last thing: since you're 50 percent franchise uh, and 50 percent company owned, have, do you think there might be any res resistance saying, "I don't want to do that. I'm a franchisee. That's not what I signed up for." Well, if the price is right, I guess people will always cave, but. Um, I'm sure they'll, I'm sure everyone has, uh, you know, the franchise owners probably have some, you know, they definitely have uh, inhibitions labor. against that. So but communication on the plan is the key. Communication would be yeah, key absolutely. for that. And they, and they have like the minimum area of five franchises, so that will help like them communicate with owners, but then if they wanted to buy all that, they'd only have to go to one person. It helps streamline that process in general.